We have parallel testing, testing the same data through two systems, comparing the results, making sure that the new system is coming up with the same results as the old system. Sociability testing, interesting, to confirm if a new or changed system can operate in the target environment without screwing up what's already there. So in other words, is it going to work well with our legacy systems? They call that sociability testing. Within phase five implementation, this is where we'll actually not, we're going to say, well, we're assuming all of the systems and the applications are working as they should and they're performing and the technical testing has been done, but will our users like it? Now we have to do user acceptance testing. This is where we find out if the user says, this is what I was expecting to get in terms of a deliverable. This is what uh, and, and, and this is what I needed this system to accomplish. Again, that focuses oftentimes purely on the functional aspect, verifying the system delivers per the documented requirements. So this user acceptance testing, also known as final acceptance testing, or FAT, occurs during the implementation phase, not in the design phase. Post-implementation, this is where we're going back with project management and users making sure that we got what we planned for and seeing how we can do it better next time. It's just like any other project review. Again, quality assurance group responsible for making sure the programs, program changes adhere to established standards and policies that we have internally. Quality assurance testing, that's QAT, is not going back to functional testing that we had with UAT, user acceptance testing, Quality assurance testing is saying, hey, look, if it was supposed to be built using .NET, did it use .NET? <laughs> and we're making sure that the systems or applications followed the actual technical specifications that we had laid out to begin with, not necessarily functional specifications. That was UAT and FAT. So, again, trying to combine the two, quality assurance testing, which is, again, testing the technical accuracy of the system in terms of the the uh, approach used, along with functional acceptance testing, says that that will often result in the risk of inadequate functional testing. That's what ISACA feels, and that's how you answer on exam day. So alternative de uh, development methods that you're going to need to know about. And folks, if you're coders, if you're programmers, and you start to uh, feel very icky on the inside because you say that's not really how we look at it today, let it go. It's okay. This is what you need to know for exam day. Types of approaches. We have incremental approaches to developing systems and software. System is built in stages. We have iterative approach, which is building successive variations based upon user feedback for software development. Each version is a new version that's based upon what complaints we got from the old version. We call that iterative, and that is building successive variations. Uh, we have evolutionary or heuristic development using prototyping. We have spiral development, starting with macro functionality, developing towards full and robust functionality, agile development, development broken down into short time boxed iterations. Folks, if you are not a systems developer, if you're not a, a software developer, and you're looking at this saying, wow, this is way too technical for me, maybe don't worry about it. We're not going to expect you to be a coder when you're done and you have your CISA certification. I just got to get you to pass these questions. And that's, so I'm giving you, um, you're going to need to know and differentiate between these different types of iterative approaches. Oh, Alan, you went and did it again. You categorized them, didn't you? Yes, I did. Here's your iterative batch, evolutionary, spiral, agile. They belong together as an iterative type approach, as opposed to component-based developing, assembling applications from cooperating packages of executable software. Prototyping, you'll need to know about the, the being able to differentiate terms and definitions of prototyping versus, again, component-based development. Rapid application development, or RAD, the advantage to it, it allows quicker development of strategically important systems. So do you need to know how to actually do it? Nope. You just need to know that that's how it's characterized, and you would be able to pick that out on an exam. Integrated Development Environment, or IDE, using an online programming facility, allowing programmers to create programs interactively. I don't know that there's another way today. 
Service Oriented Architecture, or SOA, also described on the exam. What is it? Design uh, is a design pattern based on distinct pieces of software providing application functionality. The nice thing is service oriented architecture is independent of vendors, products, and technology. Other development tools that you'll need to be aware of. We have four GL languages, fourth generation high level computer languages. The advantage is it gives us fast iteration through successive designs. My brother is a programmer and he said, no. I said, well, but I'm CISA, so go away. <laughs> I'm certified. Yep, program debugging. Uh, again, Logic Path Monitor, it's a type of debugging tool that a report sequence of steps executed by an application. A Logic Path Monitor. We have memory dumps you may have heard about when your system takes a big dump of memory. Sounds bad. Moving on, Output Analyzer is a debugging tool that checks for the results of a program for accuracy by comparing expected results with actual results. Yep, they, they officially call it an output analyzer as if that's a, a, an actual defined term somewhere. We have, again, defined terms that are real, CASE, Computer Aided Software Engineering, CASE. Again, um, using computer automation to help us design and develop things. Uh, however, using CASE doesn't automatically result in correct capture of requirements because, again, Requirements come from our users, not from the actual software engineering software. Systems acquisition. This is kind of weird. On one exam, Isaka says that, well, when we talk about systems development lifecycle, D, development, if you're developing a system, you didn't acquire it. So therefore, an old trick question was, in which phase is systems acquisition in the SDLC model. And you're supposed to recognize that if you're acquiring a system, you're not developing it, so it's not in any of those phases. That's current CISA exam. However, on more modern C-RISC exam, it is considered part of the SDLC. Yep, inconsistencies between tests. Gotta love it. But for your purposes, for this version of the CISA exam, Systems acquisition is not included in SDLC because we're developing, not acquiring. Hardware configuration analysis, critical selection and acquisition of correct operating system software. Again, just various things you've got to memorize when it comes to systems acquisition concerns and best practices. Uh, what is the most important function performed by IS management when a service has been outsourced? I already told you about this. If you outsource IT, you better monitor that outsourced IT because you can't delegate accountability. Again, uh, you're, you're reviewing an outsourced IS processing. You want to request uh, vendors' business continuity plans to make sure that they not only promise uptime, but that they can actually plan to deliver it, that kind of thing. Change management, another piece of this. Uh, again, we have to have good change management in place to make sure that uh, we don't have changes that, accidentally introduce problems. Uh, remember I told you ISACA loves that capability maturity model. Again, the, the capability maturity model begins with the lowest level, initial. That's an ad hoc individual effort. This is where we say, you know what? We just came across this issue. We just designed what we think is a good way to handle it, and we're going to do it. Great. Are you going to write that down so you can use it next time? No. No, we'll, we'll just address it afresh all over again next time. That is described as initial or an ad hoc individual effort. If we actually do then say, you know what? No, we, we want to be able to, to use this method again. That makes it a repeatable process that isn't reinvented every time. So this is where processes are established to pl uh, plan and track cost schedule functionality, and they can be repeated in similar projects. If we are so good as to actually write them down, document them, and actually share them with others across the organization, it's beyond repeatable just in our function. It's become defined throughout the organization. That's a higher level of maturity. 
So initial, then repeatable, then defined. And if we say, you know what, and we're going to measure that process to see how effective it really is. Because you can't fix something, you can't improve something that you don't measure first. Deming said so. So we, if we start to measure it against performance indicators, it's now considered to be more mature than just defined. It's considered to be managed. And if you actually identify opportunities for improvement through your monitoring and you act upon those opportunities for improvement and, in, and improve the process itself based upon your measuring and monitoring, why you have achieved the Zen level of CMM, and that is called optimize. You will need to know your five levels of CMM, initial, repeatable, defined, managed, and optimized. You'll need to know that for your CISA exam, your CISM exam, and your C-RISC exam. Process improvement practices. We also have BPR, or business process re-engineering. And this is where they talk about using benchmarking in order to better improve our baselining and benchmarking and to better improve and monitor our business process to make it better. So this benchmarking process involves planning, research, observation, and analyzing. And then finally, what we've recognized that could be improved, we actually implement and adapt. And that results in the improvement we hope to achieve. We can use process charts as evidence to review when auditing a reorganized process. What is the first step to perform in a BPR project? Why defining areas to be reviewed, scoping is what we do in any kind of audit process. So again, these are just again examy things that we memorize so that we will be ready for them when it comes test day. You know, I can talk about them quickly in eight hours, but it's going to take a lot of time to actually memorize all this stuff. But nonetheless, the cool thing is you'll be memorizing the right stuff. And I'm hoping that you'll reach out to me and contact me. Um, the um, email address and so forth I'll be giving you tomorrow, uh, but it's easy enough. First name dot last name at certifiedinfosec.com. Um, I'm about to show you a few things here now. Let's go ahead and go through a few practice questions. Um, let me check the time. Yep, we're very well on track. So let's go ahead and do a few practice questions. Uh, documentation of a business case used in an IT development project should be retained until when? How long should you keep it? Through the end of the system's life cycle? Um, just until the system's been acquired? until the system's been implemented, or the business unit management have taken formal ownership. What do you think? Folks, are you still with me? Come on. You can do it. You may remember this from a bulleted point in the presentation. We actually, uh, one of the things that I emphasized. And yes, the correct answer, according to Isaka, is you keep the business case all the way through until the end of the system's life cycle. That is the appropriate answer. So, who approves necessary resources for an IT project? Choose the best answer. Who approves necessary resources? Is it the project sponsor? Is it the IT steering committee? Is it senior management? Is it user management? What do you think it is?
Okay. We'll look at our answers in five, four, three, two, one. Last chance. And we have, well, it seems of the people who answered, almost half of them answered project sponsor. Almost half of them answered senior management. And uh, in this case, it turns out when it comes to approving necessary resources for an IT project, this is where it gets kind of weird because in reality, it could be either one because uh, the project sponsor, uh, oftentimes they won't pay for it unless they uh, uh, can approve it. But in the end of the day, the people who are supposed to be approving it are the senior management, not just the uh, project sponsor itself. How could that possibly be? Well, because it could be sometimes we can say, hey, look, finance, I know that you call it an IT system, but it's an IT system built for you. So the money for the IT system that you're requiring isn't coming out of IT's budget. It's coming out of your budget. So, again, what I've done is senior management has approved the funding of the project, even though the project sponsor, the finance department, who's actually paying for it, didn't really want to pay for it. And if you've ever been in IT for any amount of time, you know that that happens. You end up having user departments that don't want to pay for their own systems. That's what happens. So, um, moving along, we go ahead and ask who should assume the overall direction and responsibility for costs and timetables of systems development uh, projects? Is it senior management, the project sponsor, the IT project steering committee, or user management? What do you think? This will be our last question before we go through a few important tips to close the day. I appreciate you folks hanging in there with me. I know it's been a long day. And, yep, most of us got the answer right. The overall direction and responsibility for costs and timetables, when they said overall direction, that's not the project sponsor. That's just the people who pay for it. User management, they're not managing the project. Overall direction, responsibility for costs is going to be the IT project steering committee. That is correct. Okay, so in this last piece, in our last 15 minutes of the day, I'm going to go through some test-taking strategies, again, that are not really going towards a question to memorize, but rather just an approach that we can use to try to do a better job. Matter of fact, IF, we already know about uh, RTFQ, right? So that's one of my recommendations, you'll see. So let me go ahead and push this out to you. We'll, we'll finish up the day with just a few test-taking tips, so you can cool your jets and I don't have to worry about all the memorization at this point. This is just kind of a technique thing. So again, IF, you and I both agree, read the freaking question. ISACA often inserts very special conditioning uh, words or question scoping elements that focus the question on perhaps performance or compliance or reliability or authorization. In other words, it's tuning the question to a particular concern, which is really important, because they're going to say, choose the best answer. Well, the problem is that very same question tuned a little bit differently with just a different conditioning uh, word gets a different answer to the same question, depending upon if it's a availability question or if it's a confidentiality question or see where I'm going. So we have to be very careful that we look at this. Pay attention. Um, Again, ISACA has many similar questions that go to a specific, uh, some go to a specific risk or problem. Other questions may go to a process. If the question goes to a process, then choose the appropriate process rather than the problem itself. So in other words, uh, it could be that uh, 
to ensure that you have consistent remediation of issues that come up in your in your IT problems. Do you want to have this particular solution or do you want to have a good change management process that ensures proper responses? Oh, okay. When they said you want a consistent method, as soon as they say method, don't go towards an individual control. Go towards a process that manages those individual controls as opposed to if they say which of the following would be a good control to remediate, 